children from Nantonziu drinking water from the dam. The dam is the community's only primary source of water. The water looks slimy and brown. The community has depended on this water for years, but now it's beginning to have a telling effect on their health. Yakubu Habiba and her family, for instance, have been using the water from the dam for years. Recently, she's visited the hospital for treatment for complications arising out of the drinking of the water from the dam. I spent about 600 Ghana cities at the hospital. They gave me infusions and medications. The doctor asked me what I eat and I told him, truly, it is this water I use. Then he said it was the cause of my sickness. Women and children here spend hours fetching this basic necessity of life. But this same necessity of life is what's hurting them now. My name is Zubaydu Hazifa and I attend Ambari SHS. We use this water for drinking and cooking. We use it for every purpose. As you can see, this is water. This is used by my parents, siblings and everyone else for drinking and cooking. Some of the residents have drunk this water for more than three decades and they still depend on it because they do not have the wherewithal to buy sachet and bottled water. Zuberi Musa is one of the opinion leaders here. I've been consuming this dam water for over 40 years, hence I'm afflicted. So you will keep drinking the water until you see a doctor who will then determine that you are sick. You will then require significant medical attention. So what will be the long-term solution to this challenge of Nantonzio? That's the question I asked Mr. Al Hassan, the Water Quality Assurance Manager of the Ghana Water Company Limited. Best method or the superior method that can be used to treat this water is uh, conventional water treatment, which has to do with you having a, a facility that can face of all, you know, clean this water. So that you will not separate the suspended matter, the color, the turbidity all, and get clean water. Go ahead to now kill the microorganisms through what we call disinfection. If possible, you do pH adjustment. And then after that, you now test the water to see if the treatment process is, you know, optimum, is good. Say that the finished water will not contain harmful microorganisms chemicals that can be injurious to human life. When that is achieved, you can now declare the water wholesome. So with this, we recommend um, conventional method for treatment. But if there are other options like borehole drilling or uh, yes, underground water, you can drill a borehole and then maybe that one may not require so much treatment. If you are lucky and the uh, uh, water table is good. An immediate solution is what this community needs. If I won't stop drinking the water, then it is because I have no option. But if I have a way, I will stop because I know the water is not good for my health. <laughs> I saw that given the current course of events explained by the doctor, the zoo community is in danger. But how do we get out of this danger? We as a community have nothing if the wealthy people who can assist us do not do anything.
Recently, an opinion leader from the community died from kidney failure. And the community folk believe it's the consumption of the water from the dam that has resulted in the death of the 75-year-old man. I said to her, I was saddened by what the doctor said about contaminated water and diseases it can spread. Fuseni Salifu, the younger brother of Zakari Al Hassan, the deceased, is horrified by the revelations. They carry on tests upon tests, so they carry on several tests before they conclude it was uh, water uh, disease. Waterborne disease. That, that leads to the kidney failure. Mm, that was through their tests and the examination or the experience they already have. So that's how come they told us it was an uh, unsafe un, 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 un uh, water he is using. They didn't actually tell us before the thing got worse. It was just the beginning that they told her not to give him damp water again. All of us were using it. So what we've seen or what we saw make us so scared. So we don't like to use the damp water for drinking again unless using it to wash and then bath because we've seen what it has caused to us. Yes. At the Tamale Teaching Hospital, the 75-year-old was diagnosed with kidney failure. Doctors told Zakari to stop drinking from the primary source of water from the community. Many residents got alarmed by the doctor's advice to Zakari as they assumed the dam water was responsible for Zakari's kidney failure. This is Yakubu, the deceased elder son who was caring for him both at home and at the hospital. Yes, during the sickness, they even told us not to give him damp water. So they, uh, they emphasized us to be using Voltaic, and then, which is a little bit cause for us because as the community we are living, it's not all that uh, decent. So we, we struggle, but we manage our best. Throughout the sickness, we're no more giving him damp water. We try to give him uh, such as water or uh, Voltaic. That was what we were using. So was the source of water responsible for Yakubu's kidney failure? The residents have complained and blamed this water for their poor health condition. But the only way to confirm this claim is to test and analyze the water. A sample of the dam water was fed and delivered same day to the Quality Assurance Department of the Ghana Water Company. The analysis established that the water source was not safe for drinking. However, Mr. Al Hassan was unable to connect Yakubu's claims that it was the contaminated water that resulted in the kidney failure of Zachary. With this, instinctively, when you see it, you know that it's not portable. But then you cannot be carrying this sample around showing people that this is the way the water looks like. The best thing is to analyze turn this water into a data form and that is exactly what you have done so this now represents this this the results now represent the, uh, the water and if you look at the results the results clearly shows that the water is not suitable for human consumption because the physical and chemical parameters doesn't support or doesn't obey the regulatory requirement and if you look at it we have Ghana standards whatever sample you analyze the results must conform to regulatory requirement that means that the results should show that when human beings use this water for domestic purposes the water will not be injurious to their health when we did the analysis we realized that Ideally, you count the number of microorganisms in the water to tell you the level of contamination. Even for purposes of human consumption, you don't even bother to count the, the number of microorganisms because ideally 
the water shouldn't contain microorganisms. So once we see it, if you go ahead to even count, you want to determine the level of contamination. But once you see microorganisms, it means you cannot use it. But what is the extent of pollution? That is why you now go ahead to determine the numbers. Unfortunately, when we did your analysis, we realized that we can't even count. That is why we put NT, TNT, two numerals to count. The reason for doing water quality analysis is to be able to tell whether the water can cause injury to human life. And when we are talking about injury, we are not talking about instant injury. Some come as a result of long-term usage. Are you getting me? So if you are using this water over a long period of time, there are some who may even begin to show symptoms of consequences within a very short period based on their immunity. So I went to the Tamil Urology and Modern Surgical Centre to find answers. The specialist centre is located in the centre of Nantongzio. We first presented the analysis to Dr. Akis Afoku, a consultant urologist. Uh, the report shows that the water contains a heavy load of salmonella, which often causes typhoid fever. And I can say a third of children are admitted to hospital from the community for this reason. It also contains E. coli. Um, the impact or the significance of this finding is that these bacteria are actually transmitted through human excreta. So it means human excreta gets its way directly into this water. It's a fecal oral mechanism of transmission and if we have this heavy load of bacteria to the extent that the report says they are too numerous to be counted you know um, it's just such a heavy load the colony forming units cannot even be counted and indeed such water is very very unsafe for the whole community Dr. Foko says many community folk report to the facility with cases of diarrhea on a daily basis. So basically, um, even if you take a school child, for instance, if a, in a couple of days they have to be off school because they had diarrhea, and many of the community members are coming with, you know, sometimes severe diarrhea, sometimes bloody diarrhea, and indeed typhoid fever can cause perforation of the bowel that necessitates surgery. Uh, it's a, a very common cause of peritonitis, which is having a high serious morbidity and high mortality rate. You know, and salmonella in the water means that even if you use it to wash vegetables, you're going to have problems, you know. And if you're drinking this water, you're going to have serious problems. Dr. Fuku wants an urgent support for the community folk. Yeah, so um, actually the, the bladder cancers and kidney cancers are quite common and as I said the thing that is ringing an alarm bell is the fact that the age you know the age of incidence and then and the age at which people are having terminal cancer is so strikingly low you know in the places where these cancers are common they see it, you know, when you are about 60 to 70 years. And we are seeing it even in people who are not yet 20 years. And by 25, 26, they are already in a terminal stage. The cancer cannot be operated. Apart from that, actually, kidney stones are so common, you know. I just have a whole collection of kidney stones, you know. And the kidney stones, indeed, Last week we had a child of seven months with a kidney stone. I mean, that's, you know, not to talk about the older ones, you know. So kidney stones are another problem, you know, apart from the cancers. Um, also, renal failure, as I said, is, is something that is common, you know, and can be attributed to many, many conditions. Uh, but the age at which you are seeing this is also another problem because the younger people are having these these things and and as I said also the congenital malformations that we are seeing like
children are coming without, without the testes descending into the scrotum or the penis didn't form properly, you know. Um, these are really issues that we've been documenting. He says data from the community due to the drinking of the damp water is overwhelming. Because I'm research oriented, I'm sitting here with a lot of data and it's frightening because apart from the direct impact, getting them ill, having diarrhea, going to hospital, dying from it, also the younger people in the community, but certainly in this community, people are having deranged semen analysis, you know. Younger people are having smaller testes than older people, you know. And what is the future of any community or any town or any country if out of pollution from plastics, from pesticides, from, you know, you are you're now not able to reproduce. You know, nobody is going to shoot a gun and take your country. They just wait until you can't reproduce. The plastics pollution which is affecting our water body and also the pesticides are all disrupting hormones and the endocrine system. Hundreds of them. This, this came from a two-year-old, this stone. Until so some intervention comes the way of the community folk, they will continue to drink water from the dam. Okay. It's a real story. Uh, I was taken out from a patient, a 32-year-old patient who lost the kidney anyway, because it was a non-functioning kidney, so we didn't need to break it. We just took it out like that. So really, problem from contaminated water and all that. Mahmoud Mohammed Nuruddin's reports read to you. Because this kidney was lost to severe infection. That report is by my colleague Mohammed Nuruddin. Thank you so much for joining us today on the AM show. Clearly a really disturbing story from Nang Tong Zhu. And this morning as we commemorate World War today, we'll be exploring the issue and seeing how uh, the people of this community can have lasting solution. We'll also uh, just digress a bit into other national matters concerning uh, the availability of water and uh, the, the purity or uh, sanctity of the water that comes through our taps. This morning, I've been joined by Alex Owusu Sapong. He is um, National President, Network of Community Water Services. Good morning to you, and thank you for joining the program. I'm, I'm sure you just caught aspects of that story we just aired. And this may not be a surprise to you. You work in many communities across the country. Would you say this is a reflection in many of these communities you work in? Good morning. Yeah, it's a very good reflection of what we are seeing. That is why we have set up the National Community Network Water System to help such communities to get portable drinking and sustainable water to drink. Mm. Nana, I mean, let's just zoom into the solutions. Uh, there are those who say that we must begin exploring, you know, privatizing water supply because it appears that the Ghana Water Company Limited alone cannot do this. Um, the, to be fair to the company, uh, they say that we don't even pay as much as we should for them to run effectively, i.e. extend water services, you know, provide us the needed maintenance and all that we need to ensure that we have portable water. Do you think that will be uh, um, a, a sure way of solving this problem and reaching such underserved communities? Yeah, in my opinion, I would say yes, because um, when you have something, you look after it. But if you have something and you want somebody to look after it, it's not as good as you looking after your own thing. So if uh, we can give the water system to the local communities and give them the proper education and the support to maintain their own water system, I think it will be easier for the Ghana Water Board and we will take a bit of, not even a bit, a lot of um, weight off their shoulders. 
So I think we should cooperate in the, not privatization as such, but giving the water system to the local communities, the local leaders, chiefs and queen mothers, assemblymen, and then give them the right knowledge on how to uh, maintain it and sustain it for their own good. Yeah, I'll come back to you. Let me uh, now engage the communications manager of the Ghana Water Company Limited, Mr. Stanley Marty. Good morning and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, Mr. Marty, you just had the suggestion of uh, Mr. Wusu Sapong. Is, is this something that you're exploring, um, working with communities to have their own, you know, maybe small water treatment system that they can manage so that all the burden is not on the Ghana Water Company Limited. You've complained over time that, you know, the money you even generate through revenue is not enough to keep the company running. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, yes, um, our doors are open for um, any discussion at all concerning provision of water to the people of, of Ghana. And I must say uh, that we are already uh, in touch with most communities to see how best we can support each other. And then the ultimate objective is for everybody to have access to, 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 to water. So we are doing a lot in that vein. In some areas, we are even selling bulk water um, to some communities and even to the Community Water and Sanitation Agency, especially in areas where they fall under, 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 under rural uh, categorization, so that they can um, in turn, distribute the water within the communities and then collect the necessary uh, revenue. So um, there's a lot being going on. We're exploring, we are still exploring, and um, all in the bid to um, have or meet the SDG goals by 2030, that is um, access to water um, for all or by all. So uh, a lot is being done in that vein. And like I keep saying, our doors are open to all discussions. Anything that um, can support um, the provision of water to Ghanaians, we are in for it. And most importantly, serving them with quality, good quality uh, water, because we can't just supply water that is not of good quality. So as a, as, as, as a company, um, uh, we are doing everything that we can to ensure that the right things are being done and so that the people of Ghana can have enough and adequate uh, portable water for, to consume. Mm. Um, talking about the quality of water, and this is not the first time you're saying this, the water leaves your treatment sites in the best standard, in the best shape, but does it reach us in that same quality? Um, currently, as I speak, the Ghana Water Company Limited has subscribed to the Water Safety Plan uh, um, worldwide, or glo the global or international um, water safety plans. And this is expected to, um, to uh, uh, as a risk assessment, uh, it's, expected, it's expected of us to manage our water from um, the abstraction stage to the final consumer. And the PLC has also given us the same standards uh, as a KPI. So we are supposed to work by it. So as it is now, the you're not you're not able to tell me because I'm asking this because no, I, I'm, I'm building a point. All I'm right. Building a point. Okay. So what I'm saying is that with all these in place, okay, um, we are expected to ensure that water water at any stage before consumption is, is safe, and that is exactly what the Ghana Water Company is doing. So throughout the processes, we test at every stage. We keep testing at every stage to ensure that there's no contamination, there's no abnormality in terms of um, the analysis for, 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 for the water. So we are doing a lot. So even at the even our, uh, for the raw water, on hourly basis, we test to see whether the parameters in there uh, are okay and wouldn't hamper uh, the treatment process. And at every stage of the treatment process, on hourly basis, uh, we, we, we do the test and we have the recordings. I mean, uh, we've had this data from God, only God knows when. Okay, so every hour uh, we test. And then within our communities, we also do what we call uh, post chlorination. So our water quality assurance department drives through our communities on a daily basis, sample water, do the analysis, and to ascertain that the water still uh, meets the quality that we expect that uh, it should be. It should be. So then we do post chlorination as well to take care of 
some uh, contaminants that, that may have seeped through, that may have seeped through, um, let's get that very well, uh, through the line into, into our homes. Yeah. And then when the water gets into our homes, the owners uh, now lies on we, the consumers, to manage the water very well in terms of storage and, 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 and all that, mm -hmm. so that at least um, the water will be safe. Okay, so we do all these things. I want to assure the general public, I want to assure the public, and Ghanaian, Ghanaian, the Ghanaian public and, uh, as a whole, that water that flows through our pipelines meets the best uh, standards. Okay, so apart from the water safety plants that takes care of um, the water from extraction, age to, uh, extraction stage to the consumer, we also uh, use the World Health Organization standards and that of the Ghana standards authorities standards for drinking water. Now, we as a company also have a target when it comes to quality. And uh, our targets are higher than the standards of Ghana standards authority and that of WHO. So you must be, um, um, well, well, you must be, uh, you have all the assurance that the water that flows through uh, our pipelines meets the best of standards and you can consume without any challenge. Mm. Thank you. Uh, uh, earlier you said, contaminants which may have seeped through and and this is what as a result of what um bust pipes or old pipes what exactly causes this yes so one one of the the, the challenge that causes that is the uh, best pipes within our communities and then we have people who also uh, recruit um unprofessional plumbers to do connections for them and the pipelines are buried. So if the connection is not done very well and buried, definitely you are going to have some uh, some seepage into the pipelines. Mm -hmm. And then when there's the best, you definitely uh, there should be some uh, some seepage. Now you realize that in some communities, people even lay pipelines through the drainage, all in in, in a bid to uh, um, um, to to uh, I've been trying to you know uh, go past the, the normal way of doing things, and then especially with the illegal connections, and assuming, assuming that there's a best or there's a, some leakage on the pipeline, definitely the a dirty water from the drainage could sit through the line. So all these things are possibilities, and that is why we go through the communities on a daily basis to do post-chlorination and also to sample uh, the water in some areas mm. and do the analysis and to find out whether there hasn't been any seepage. All right. I'll come back to you. Let me now bring in Dr. Ronald Abrahams. He is Chief Basin Officer of Water Resources Commission. Uh, good morning to you too, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you may have seen the story we heard before this conversation, a farming community in, in the northern part of the country where residents have to rely on um, highly polluted water source because they don't have access to potable water. And this is leading to serious health issues. Um, um, the doctors in the area talk about cancers, kidney issues, even babies um, having to pass kidney stones. And that tells you the gravity of the issue. Um, just yesterday on the Midday News on Joy FM, we had a story where uh, the... Deputy Director at the CSIR was raising concerns about the turbidity of our waters. Um, I, I have heard stories in the past of how people in the country who didn't have access to potable water could at least rely on natural resources or even collected water which was not polluted and that didn't give them these serious complications. So while we wait for the Ghana Water Company Limited and other private individuals or the benevolence of individuals to reach people like these with potable water, what can we do to preserve the existing water bodies and ensure that uh, even if they have to rely on that, they are not exposed to such serious pollution and contamination? All right, thank you very much. I think uh, what we need to do is to begin to change our way of life, which is the culture that uh, we have to really cope with these situations where Ghana Water Company, and for that matter, Gabon, has not been able to provide potable water to all communities. We have to keep our natural water system very clean of pollution and give up this habit of uh, indiscriminate disposal of waste, having a home without a toilet, and a host of other things that we do with our water system. 
It is amazing when you see the way people actually even do farming. Mm -hmm. You know, in mm -hmm. places where we have water sources or maybe streams actually going through or nearby the farm. There are principles and then policies that time is to suggest that if you are doing farming or any other activities apart from uh, mining, you need to actually leave a buffer zone. The buffer zones are meant to really filter or clean the water before it gets into the mainstream. And we have a system in Ghana also which actually disposes of wastewater into gutters. Gutters are not meant for wastewater. Mm. They are meant to redirect rainwater. But here is a case where somebody puts up a restaurant and they are discharging their waste into these things. We have all the systems in place. We have the assemblies, we have EPA, we have water and commissions, and all the regulatory bodies that are supposed to look at these things. We are doing our best. And what we need currently is to get the citizenry to meet these regulatory bodies halfway through. If we have a culture of not wanting to pollute, Ghana will be clean. And for that matter, it will translate into our water systems, and you will realize that our water bodies will be clean. In countries where people have waste water headline, which meant that uh, water waste water will not get into the natural water system, you know, those countries are clean. And when you get into their natural water system, they are clean. We have had the cost to sample water from a uh, our forest, mm -hmm. just for um, testing purposes to see what uh, the content will be. And when we came to GWCL, we just planned to test it. We saw that it compares to the treated work, which means, which means that uh, we need to really uh, be up and coming with the kind of water we have. I'm sorry, Doc, I missed you a bit. Did you say the water in the Etiwa forest was better off or not? Well, comparable to treated water, treated okay. uh, water at uh, Weja. Mm. And uh, that should tell you that we can have clean water which can be reliable, or we can call it potable water or drinking water from sources such as uh, that where Pollution has no case. Of course, if water runs through a city and the city has been so positioned that no wastewater actually gets into our gutters, even, you know, because the gutters are actually designed to really release water into natural water sources, and eventually we have them getting into our river system. Although it has become what it is now because we have allowed household waste to get into it and people who are even squatting from other regions of this country are in places where we should actually find out where they are coming from and why they are there because you can't sleep in a kit and then uh, you will not pollute uh, gutter water which is not supposed to be polluted. So the assembly has um, a huge responsibility to ensure that they don't allow people to live anywhere and if there is a home that home should not de uh, depend on public toilets. Well, we should have the, our own toilets in our home. And then be careful that uh, the entities that are there to manage solid waste are getting all the waste channeled to them. Mm. They should also be responsible. Someone said somewhere that we should be interested in seeing what even the waste management companies are doing to the waste we give to them. Because you follow a vehicle and by the time you realize the whole load, a big load of solid waste drops in the middle of the street and they don't care two hoots about it. They drive on and they leave it there. And then other vehicles pass over it and then they spread. So in the process of being transported, what we are currently preaching to the assemblies is that every assembly should have its own solid waste plant and then its own liquid waste Doc. plant. I mean, they should so have. We have uh, a big responsibility also to really continue the awareness, creation, education, and training, and then enforce the law as strict as possible. Doc, they should have, but the problem with us, um, and, and, and as we have these conversations over the years and months, is, is that we know what to do. We have laid down plans in our books, but when it comes to implementation, there's a, there's a 
huge problem there. Yeah. The picture you've just painted, I don't know how you feel and how other people feel, but it, it, it appears quite complex because you're talking about systems and a whole network that probably needs to be overhauled. Yeah. There needs to be a really dramatic change because you talk about drainage and my mind is just going all over Accra looking at what the drainage system is like even here and how that yeah. probably affects us. Let me bring in Nano Wusu Sapong now. He's with the network of community water services and um, its president. Nana, you've heard Doc, you've heard Mr. Stanley Marty. Do you get a sense that we appreciate the, the level of seriousness this poses to us as a country, like I said, quoting the deputy director of the CSIR? He is concerned that, look, we may, we may start importing water. Do you get a sense that even for us as, as citizens, we appreciate and we, ex we un understand the extent of this. Hello, Mr. Sapong. Do I have Mr. Sapong on? Um, Kylie, unmute, sir. Nana Sapong, kindly unmute your device. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, I'll start from what the uh, director of the Ghana Water Company said. That they've got too much on their heads. That is why I'm selling the idea that part of the job should be given to the private sectors and the communities themselves to find a way of providing their own water system, maintaining it, like the net coas, for example, if you join the NETCOAS, they will give you a water system. They will educate you on how to maintain it because um, water is not for free. But mm. if we leave everything on the Ghana Water Company, then the private areas like the Nanton that we are just watching would definitely be reached when everybody on that village, everybody living in that village is dead. And to what doctor also said, it's right. I've experienced that in my village very recently, that a whole person who has got that title of a doctor acquired the land around there. And it is just about, um, not even a hundred meters, just about 50 meters away from uh, a river which serves as drinking water for about five villages and all the farmers around there. Throwing uh, feces intentionally, collecting mm. human feces mm. and depositing them on the land that he is fertilizing the land, which I stopped him. So this, uh, this uh, disposal of feces, waste, plastics and everything is a very good contributory factor to uh, polluted waters. Mm. But so, Nana, yeah, so the, the problem is we have, we clearly have a waste management problem in this country. Even those who are signed on to companies that are expected to come and pick the, uh, the, the, the collect their waste regularly, they realize that it doesn't happen over time. These companies complain that, look, we, we have too, too many people to serve and to attend to, so it's difficult to come. So clearly, we admit there's a waste management problem. There also is an access to water problem. There's a drainage system problem. And it's a very complex situation. Beyond reaching... Uh, these underserved communities like Nantong, you come to Accra and there are people here who don't even have water. But besides that, how do we ensure that we're even getting the quality that we deserve? And how do we ensure that all these other elements that play a part in ensuring that we have good water are also running effectively, concurrently? Yeah, like what I said at first, the first interview, um, if we are allowed to look after our waters ourselves and we have the right education I think we will look after them better because for instance if there is a village and with the help of a company like Netcoas they've been able to uh, acquire a portable drinking water and they have to look after it if they have the education and they have the knowledge they will know that they now have a portable drinking water and the chief or the queen mother of that village will make sure that it's being maintained and sustained 
so that they will always get the portable drinking water. So I think um, if we give the chance to these private companies who are very serious, uh, who wants to work with the traditional councils and the assemblymen, um, the problem will be partly solved. Right. Uh, Mr. Stanley Martin, let's zoom in on Nam Thong um, are you able to tell us now what exactly the problem is with reaching that particular community with portable water from the Ghana Water Company Limited? No, you know, the water sector is such that um, uh, this is a relation between rural and urban water. Right. So the GWCL serves urban um, uh, communities, while well mm. community water and sanitation agency serves the rural communities. Right. So um, that is how the, uh, the sector is. And um, we need to appreciate and work and work uh, uh, as it is. Um, there's a definition for, for rural and there's a definition for urban. Mm. If, for instance, there's an rural area that after some period, okay, or after some time, um, uh, uh, grows into an urban community, definitely the system will be shifted to GWCL. And then um, there are some communities that fall under rural water but by virtue of their location, we have had to supply them water. So, for instance, if there's a community that has a main transmission line from a treatment plant to um, the city, go through that community, uh, sometimes you are uh, obliged to supply them with water. So, we either sell the bulk water to community water to, to manage within the community, mm -hmm. or we, we take care of the community uh, ourselves. And then there's the peri urban. Um, areas that we also do well to, to serve. So it depends on uh, your location and it depends on some other factors. So if everything goes well and we have to supply you water, why not? We will. The ultimate aim is for all Ghanaians to have access to um, uh, portable and good drinking water. Mm, and this community uh, and sanitation water services that serve the rural communities, are they in the same condition or situation as you find yourselves where um, there's not enough money to keep it running as you would want it. So for areas where we serve, um, we uh, all um, all our activities um, also go to uh, those areas. So for instance, uh, if we serve any community that may uh, come under the definition of rural, but it's said by Ghana Water Company Limited, our quality assurance department will still go there and to do the, the, the necessary things that they have to do in terms of post chlorination in terms of sampling of the water to or, or for the daily analysis and, and, and all that. But if it doesn't lie within our jurisdiction, then until uh, the GWCL is called to help, uh, we do not go there. But I know that the community water is also improving on their services, uh, coming out with laboratories and and all that to enable them to do some of these uh, uh, activities. They also fall on us anytime they need um, our, our, our support. We are sister agencies and we all fall on the same ministry. So mm. we support each other to ensure that the uh, Ghanaian populace is served very well. Mr. Marty, um, based on your understanding of how the system works, existing policy, the attitude of Ghanaians, how soon do you see us dealing with these problems, especially when it comes to ensuring that from the pumping site to the homes, we have good, clean, quality water? Uh, I think I've explained, but it's important, so I'll reiterate. Okay, now we have, um, uh, we, we, we use the um, World Health Organization standards in treating water. We use... Um, um, the Ghana Standards Authority standards for drinking water, and then we have our own target. Okay, and I've just also said that the PLC has given us the International Water Safety Plan as a KPI or as a key performance uh, 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 index mm. to enable us serve our customers, to enable us ensure that uh, the water from the point of abstraction to the final consumer meets the best um, quality standards and then and then safe as well. So uh, we go through that process, and we can we can't uh, relent on that because it's a serious KPI. And you also will have to know that even we, the staff of Ghana Water Company Limited, we also consume the same water. We also live within the communities, so we can pump uh, 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 unwholesome water uh, into the system. So we ensure that 
apart from all these plans, we also think of ourselves, we also think of our families, and we also think about everybody. So we always ensure that the water is the best of quality, so that at least all of us uh, uh, will be safe. The public health is also a concern to us, okay, as a company. So we do not relent on our standard operating procedures, and we ensure that everything goes the way they should. Thank you, uh, I think I should make my question clearer. I'm saying that based on the picture that has been painted here, um, the issues of uh, waste management, the issue of uh, people even not storing the water in the right way, the issue of government policy, um, the issue of the general attitude of Ghanaians towards um, water resources and preserving water et al., how soon do you think that we'll be able to get to that desired point where, one, there's access to portable water, and then, two, people do not have issues of contamination? Currently, we have the SDG goals um, as our target. Okay, so per the vision of the GWCL and the vision of government and the SDG goals, we are working assiduously at meeting 100% access to water and ensuring that it is safe and portable for, for consumption. So we are seriously working at that, and uh, uh, all things being equal, by 2030, we should be able to meet the target. There are interventions that, uh, we're, that makes us hopeful that we should be able to do that. Currently, um, access to water in Ghana is around 90%. Uh, uh, in the last few years, there's been expansion of our treatment plants. There's been um, a lot of projects ongoing, okay? We are lever leveraging on technology and doing a, a number of things. And we are sure uh, and hopeful that all things being equal and God on our side, we should be able to meet that target by 2030. Even if we are unable to meet it, it means we'll be so close that Ghanaians um, will, will, will be comfortable. So rest assured, and we have the vision and we, we know that uh, um, God, with, with, the help, with, with God's help, we should be able to, uh, to attain that target. Uh, Dr. Abrahams, do you share in that optimism that by 2030 we will be able to achieve our targets of um, access to portable quality water? Yes, we could, we could come very close to that. It's all a matter of uh, attitudinal change. I am hopeful and uh, it is uh, my expectation that things will change because once um, upon a time I got visitors from Germany and I took them around the door areas, very polluted areas, and then uh, they told me I shouldn't worry because they were once there mm. polluting all their water bodies, but uh, gradually the attitude changed and then they are where they are, where waste has become a big business and they are not even getting enough waste to treat uh, internally. So we can get to the stage where everything has changed and we have actually caught on with the, um, you know, the craziness to keep our environment clean mm. and then uh, we ensure that uh, we don't put things into our system. And then we change our odor into a kind of a thing as we see in the UK. So things are going to change. And now that we are making strides in making education free, I think it will give place to people getting more and more enlightened because we'll have then an elite society. So we should keep on rolling out the good policies and try and find the money. We like saying we don't have money too much. I pray and hope that some authorities of the local government assemblies are listening to us. They should be happy to spend a lot of their money on putting up funds. That will say every assembly should have one. We shouldn't transport with from places or with water from uh, places which are far off and then in the process we don't have specialized vehicles that to actually fill up the waste and release when they have to but we open them and then they drop the way they do and then the bicycles should be uh, well educated so we have actually adopted an internal policy to say that we have to intensify and sustain awareness creation by mm -hmm. the thinking venture and we are looking for the financial model to do this, some of these things. So I am very optimistic, and sometimes people actually make fun of my optimism because uh, Ghana is just a matter of time and it's about a signal change, and we can bring ourselves very close and compete.
Right, Doc. So I'm sorry to interject. Mm. Sorry to interject, but the, the, the example you cited of your guests who came from Germany, is it? Yeah. Who um, gave you some hope that they were one step, but the story has changed. Are we taking the same steps? Are we on track to achieving that? And, yeah. and if not, what should we do to get to that point? I think we must continue to preach or to continue the awareness creation because sometimes it's ignorance, sometimes it's attitude. The attitude will have to be met with strict law enforcement. And we should actually get people to get into trouble when they do the wrong thing. And uh, we, we, we don't have to, even when you drive through a port residential area, you will encounter places that are very unsightly. You know, where garbage, solid waste is hanging around people's walls, and you ask yourself questions, who are living in these homes in airport residential area? So it's a nationwide challenge, and we have to bring ourselves to the task of dealing with these things. All the time, it's important for, you know, landlords or housekeepers to go around, down, walk around their areas and see what is happening, even at the back of your wall, first wall. You should be able to check what is going on there. If you see something which is not okay, you have to fix it. You have to fix it. Sometimes you have to come out with your own spade or shovel or whatever it is and then deal with some of the you know, sanitation problems that we have countrywide. We should be happy. I worked in a community in the UK and they said growing flowers and keeping their, uh, the frontage of their homes clean is a kind of competition. We try to do that here, right? We try we tried Operation Clean Your Frontage. Even yes, the president declared... Uh, yeah, Doc, even the president declared making Accra the cleaner city in Africa by the end of his first term that was revised. I don't know where you live, but I drive through the streets of Accra and I wonder what real action is being taken to make that, uh, that promise a reality. So once again, you see that we, we, we have the plans. We, we, I remember the, the Greater Accra Regional Minister, Mr... Uh, Henry Corte went through the streets of Accra with some, um, um, you know, young people who are supposed to be ensuring that people keep the frontages of their homes clean. Yeah. We don't know what's happening with that. And so there's a lot of talk, but really, does that translate into action for you? And when it comes to the issue of money, you just wonder if it yeah. is a thing of um, no money or really an issue of priority for us. Yeah. So, uh, as I was saying, Togo is as far as Ghana. I was uh, fortunate to attend uh, a meeting at Togo. And I realized immediately that they had cleaner communities somehow uh, than we have. And uh, it is all because of their law and then enforcement of these things. So, we should uh, go in a stepwise manner to get there, as I was saying. You can have people who are not so rich, but they keep the environment very clean. And then when the money arrives, you do what you have to do to ensure that you have polished up. So we have to compete among ourselves. I will keep my, the frontage of my home and then the inside very clean just to suggest to my neighbor that he should do the same. And sometimes we can beckon uh, neighbors to do the same. I go out of my house try to pick this plastic stuff. And then within a short while, you will see neighbors releasing theirs and then I get a bite of what I don't want. So we should all be committed. You shouldn't come out of the house, cross a road, a natural road in front of the house, and then on the other side, you just dump your waste there, allow them to be there for a while, and then when you feel like burning, you come out burn. Even the burning of this plastic has its own uh, challenges, health uh, implications. So we should be interested in competing among ourselves and then set some targets for ourselves to say that let me have my own personal operation, keep my home and my home frontage clean. And I think it is just a spirit of, you know, you know, patriotism trying to keep the environment clean, which will change everything. We should be interested. We talk too much about poverty and then we actually dismiss some of these things which are very important for our good health and then their long life. Mm. Gentlemen, let me take your final words, starting with you, um, Mr. Owusu Sapong. You 
have been doing this work for a while. You help communities access water through the uh, network of community water services where you serve as president. So if there's somebody who wants to help a community like Nantongzu um, access portable water through your outfit, how do they do it? And how can we reach out to you in terms of... Um, uh, like the Ghana Water Company Limited, like this, you know, sitting down to have engagements. Basically, tell us how that can happen. Hello, Nana, what's this happening? If you can hear me, kindly unmute your device so we can hear your response. Yeah, first, I'll recommend uh, NetCovers to all the communities, chiefs and assemblymen to join NetCovers because we give you complete access to your water services. We help you financially, we help you technically, and then we give you the education as well. So if all these people, uh, all the chiefs in the communities will uh, join the NETCOAS, I think uh, they can have the power because they have the power, especially in the rural areas. They have the power to control the place uh, Ghana Water Company doesn't live in the rural areas. CWSA doesn't live in the rural areas. It is the chiefs and the uh, assemblymen that are always there to, for example, control waste disposals and then maintain their own water services. So I recommend NETCOAS to all of you. And if you want to join NETCOAS, you can get NETCOAS on a PO box a N one A two six zero one A two six zero Accra North. Or you can get us when you Google, you will get Netcovers, call us, speak to us, we will send you a form to fill and then we'll engage you. We'll give you financial support, loans to build your own water services, we'll give you the education to maintain your own water services, and then you pass it on to the other villages that are around you. We are ready for every village that needs a portable water supply. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, and your final words, uh, Mr. Stanley Marty. Yes, um, I think um, I'd want to encourage all Ghanaians um, to have um, faith in the water that flows through our taps because they meet the best of standards. And so um, they should rest assured that the Ghana Water Company Limited will do everything in this, uh, in this quest to, to supply water to a portable and safe drinking water to the people of, of Ghana. Now, uh, the water, with almost every input into the production of water is also imported into the country, um, as a, which means or which implies that we use a foreign exchange. So if with the little times that we are charging Ghanaians, we also refuse to pay, it affects our patients. Now we want to serve our people and serve our people very well. So our expectation is that all Ghanaians um, will um, uh, be responsible enough and be settling their, their bills promptly so that the GWCL can also invest back in, into, into the system to serve, to serve them well. And um, I want to wish um, all Ghanaians a happy World Water Day, and um, which is expected to uh, create some awareness so that at least some awareness on our water resources, that we all manage our water resources very well, so that to serve us and serve for posterity as well. So we, we, uh, uh, the pollution of our river bodies must stop, um, not only through Ill illegal mining, mm -hmm. but also through fish, fish farming, uh, through in that, in, in, in the dislodging of industrial effluent and sand winning and all other activities that pollute our river bodies. Let us manage our water resources very well. Thank you very much. And thank you too, uh, Mr. Stanley Marty. Finally, Dr. Ronald Abrahams, Chief Basin Officer with the Water Resource Resources Commission. Uh, you get a final bite at this as we commemorate World Water Day today. We've been speaking about access to portable water, focusing on Nantong Zoo in the northern part of Ghana. So your final words, uh, Dr. Abrahams, as we wrap up the conversation. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think... Um what I want to say is that land and water are bad fellows. Whatever you do to land, it will get into water because water is actually moving in the lowest part on land. 
and then we need to be careful because if you keep a clean, natural or built environment, obviously your water bodies will be clean. So we should be interested in what happens around. Every space around you is part of a water catchment. So whatever you do there is very important. You have to keep your water clean. And we should be interested in ensuring that our neighbors are actually doing the same. And then we have the same kind of spirit. And together, we can keep our environment clean and healthy. And we'll enjoy the benefits of long life and good health. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully the next time we have this conversation, you will be as optimistic as you are today uh, concerning Ghana's ability to read the SDG uh, uh, on access to portable clean water by 2030. You're watching the AM show with me, Bernice Apubedulansa. I know you have a lot to say. You may want to share something with us that will come up later in the show when we get interactive with you. We'll take a quick breather now. When we come back, Benjamin Akapo will be delving into the conversation concerns by Ghanaian students in Hungary who haven't received stipends from, from government for over eight months to stay. <laughs> 